My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Now, today's video is on the COVID-19 virus. As you know, we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And whilst we know that the virus predominantly affects the lungs, there have been several reports of patients dying out of cardiac complications. So there have been suggestions that it could in some way damage the heart. And this has caused a great deal of concern amongst uh, the general public. And a lot of people have written to me and said, can you try and clarify what you understand about the virus and its effects on the heart? So the first thing to say is that we have very limited data at the moment. Uh, we are very limited because this virus is only about five months old. We're very limited uh, regarding our understanding of the virus, how it uh, behaves, and most importantly, the long-term consequences of being infected with the virus. Whatever we know is constantly evolving, and what I tell you today may completely change tomorrow as more, res more uh, research is accrued and we know more about it. I can tell you what we know about it at the moment, okay? So before I talk about the COVID-19 virus and damage, the first thing to talk about is how do we look for damage? How do we look for heart damage? Because once we understand that, we'll sort of, it'll make more sense. So there are two main tools that we look to try and work out whether, that we use to try and work out whether the heart has suffered any kind of damage whatsoever. The first is a blood test. It is called troponin. When the heart is damaged, the heart muscle is damaged, the muscle breaks down and it releases protein in our blood, which can be measured through a blood test. And that is called the troponin level. And that's a very easy blood test to do. Now, what we know is that if your troponin is normal, you haven't sustained any heart damage. If your troponin is elevated, then that indicates a degree of heart damage. It doesn't necessarily tell you why that heart damage has occurred. It just tells you that the heart has been, that some cells have been damaged in the heart. Now, it is broadly safe to say that the higher the value of the troponin, the larger the amount of damage. And this is true for populations. So populations that have very high levels of troponin have in general suffered more damage than pay, uh, a population of patients who have a lower level of troponin rise. However, it is very difficult to say in an individual patient and in my own day-to-day -day practice, not in the COVID population, but in general patients, I will find some people who have very high troponin rises but haven't damaged much of their heart muscle and other patients may not have such a high rise but may have damaged a larger part. But in essence, if your troponin is normal, then very unlikely that you've damaged any heart muscle. If your troponin is elevated, then that points to heart muscle damage. So that is one test that we use to, um, to look for damage. The second test that we use is something called an echocardiogram, an ultrasound based test where you can actually visualize the heart. When the heart is damaged to any large extent, the damaged bit of the heart will not move as well as the undamaged bits, and you can see that. Uh, and the larger <clears throat> the amount of damage, uh, the less effective the heart becomes as a pump, and the worse the long-term outlook of the patient. Both, again, I think the, long, the worse the outlook of the patient, both in the short term, the medium term, and in the long term. Um, not all damage that is sustained to the heart is seen on the echocardiogram, but if there is a lot of damage, then you can see it very clearly on the echocardiogram. It is also true to say that sometimes uh, you may see a lot of damage on the echocardiogram, but if you then treat the offending thing that has caused the damage, or if you remove the trigger, or if you treat it, then the heart can strengthen back up. And you can then start seeing those bits which weren't moving regain function. And this improvement can also be visualized on an echocardiogram. So of the two tests, troponins are very easy to do, simple blood test. Echocardiography is a little bit more difficult because it requires a machine, it requires specialized personnel to do it. And in the COVID population, it involves more exposure to the potentially infectious patient for the person who's doing the test. So a lot of what we know uh, about um, COVID-19 and heart muscle and heart damage comes from studies using troponin, the blood test, right? Not so much uh, using echocardiography. Troponin will detect 
any heart injury. Echocardiography detects injury which is so large that it is actually causing a visual problem with the heart uh, to pump blood out. So troponin will go up even on if you uh, damage a few cells. On echocardiogram, however, you will only pick it up if you've got a large number of a large area of the heart which is not contracting as well. And therefore, echocardiography, if there is a large area of the heart that isn't pumping, then the heart's function as a pump becomes compromised and this condition is called heart failure. Okay, so that's just to how we detect damage whenever, you know, when we're looking at the heart, how do we detect damage? That's how we do it. The second question then is to talk about the COVID-19 and what we know about heart damage from the COVID-19 virus. Now, several studies from China have suggested that patients who have active COVID infection also seem to have a higher likelihood of having an elevated rise in these blood markers called the troponin, suggesting heart damage. Okay. The studies, however, have been mainly in hospitalized patients, and therefore, by definition, these are people who are sicker than just the kind of people who would get a minor flu-like illness and never go to a hospital. So a lot of what we know about heart damage comes from studies using troponin and in patients who are by definition sicker and have re needed hospitalization. In these patients, these hospitalized patients, the prevalence of troponin rise is about 7 to 28%. So 7 to 28% of hospitalized patients will have some evidence of myocardial injury because of elevated troponin levels. It is also true to say that the likelihood of um, finding elevated troponin levels is greater in those patients who are sicker and in general those patients who have a poorer outcome or the patients who are more likely to die. There was a really interesting study where they looked at 416 patients from China and in those patients, these patients have been hospitalized with COVID-19, 20% of these patients had elevated troponins. These patients were generally older they generally had a greater burden of comorbidity, so they had more high blood pressure, more diabetes. There were already some people who had had heart attacks in the past. They already had damaged hearts. These patients also had more severe evidence of lung injury, so their COVID um, um, lung injury was much greater, and they were in general much sicker. When you looked at what happened to these patients with troponin elevation, compared to those patients who had uh, no rise in troponin, what we found was that the mortality rates in the group that had the elevated troponin was super high, so 51% compared to 4.5% in those people who didn't have a troponin rise. In fact, if the troponin was high, then when the patient was admitted, then the likelihood of that patient dying from the COVID-19 virus was four times greater than an identical patient whose troponin was not raised. So there is no doubt a substantial number of people have myocardial injury, and those people who have myocardial injury tend to do worse uh, from their COVID-19. So this is clearly very concerning data. However, it is not quite clear from these studies whether there is something about the virus that is directly attacking the heart and thereby causing the injury, or whether it was an indirect uh, effect of the virus. The virus made the patient very sick, uh, the patient's body was very stressed, and that caused an already pre-existing condition to flare up and misbehave and complicate the patient's disease course. Why is this important to figure out? Why is it important to figure out whether the virus is affecting the heart directly, whether it's attacking heart muscle, or whether it's just causing a flare up uh, in a patient who's already sick and also already got underlying conditions? I suppose it's important to know this because if the virus directly affects the heart or directly attacks the heart, that in some way it may cause adverse consequences in young, otherwise healthy patients. So if you don't have underlying disease, you get hit by the virus, the virus attacks your heart, then that could cause heart damage in otherwise healthy people. And more importantly, even though you may be 
you know, you may have had a very mild illness. If the virus has in some way damaged your heart, you may not even know about it, but it may increase the risk of something bad happening in the future, such as heart rhythm disturbances or heart failure. So I think it is really important to try and work out whether the virus actually directly um, uh, attacks the heart and damages otherwise healthy people or whether it is just something that is causing a stress causing more stress in an unhealthy body and therefore causing the unhealthy underlying diseases to misbehave so <clears throat> if we found that um, the virus was directly affecting the heart then one could make a case for testing everyone identifying those people who have had the virus at any point and then examining their heart in a lot more detail, investigating their heart, looking for evidence of damage. And if there is evidence of damage, then starting medications early on so that their outlook in the long run is better. All right. So that's why I think it's important. Um, anyway, let's think about some of the mechanisms by which the virus could cause this heart damage. Uh, the first um, mechanism is something called viral myocarditis. In this, what we're saying is that the virus directly attacks the heart muscle uh, and in so doing, it causes inflammation and starts damaging the heart muscle cells. Is this possible? Yes, maybe it's possible. Why? Because we know that the virus, when it gets into the lung, needs something called the ACE2 receptor. And we also know that these receptors exist within the heart. So it's plausible that the virus could directly um, uh, attack the heart. Is there any evidence to confirm this? No. To confirm the, uh, the presence of the virus directly affecting the heart, what you would have to do is you would have to take a bit of the heart muscle out and look for the virus and see the virus in a biopsy. Uh, under a microscope. Now, the problem with that is this is a very invasive procedure. Taking a bit of the heart out to look at under the microscope is uh, invasive. It's, a, it's quite a dangerous procedure. Uh, but there have been some case reports where people, young people who have come in with the virus have had to have a biopsy of the heart. And in those patients, there has been no direct observation of the virus in the heart muscle. So from what very little data we have, it doesn't appear that the virus actually directly affects the heart muscle. It doesn't directly attack the heart muscle so far. It may change as we, we get more evidence. Uh, so that's one mechanism, but so far there's nothing to confirm this. The second me me mechanism is just simply a lack of oxygen. The big problem with the virus is that it makes the lungs very wet and very stiff and that this means that there's difficulty in getting oxygen from the lungs into the bloodstream. And because of that, and the body needs oxygen, less oxygen is getting through into the body. If you then add in the stress of everything having to work harder to combat this virus, your demand has gone up, your supply has gone down. So everything takes a double hit. And therefore the heart is working harder, um, but it is getting less oxygen. And even if you have no underlying problems, just that can cause heart muscle to suffocate and cause heart muscle to die. So just the fact that you're working the heart much harder and you're not giving it enough oxygen, even though you may not have an underlying problem with your heart, could potentially cause a degree of myocardial injury. So that's another mechanism. The third mechanism is uh, something called stress cardiomyopathy. So what we do know is that when the body is under extreme stress, such as very bad intercurrent illnesses, we know this from people who are admitted to intensive care unit, there can be such a massive release of stress hormones that it can actually cause a rise, it can actually paralyze the heart, okay? This is called stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Some, um, it is also manifested as something called Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy. It can cause the heart to become stunned and the heart doesn't contract as well. And when you then do this blood test, the troponin, you find it to be elevated because of this surge of stress hormones. Uh, and that's um, another mechanism. The good news is, that once the stressor has been taken away, if the patient gets better, then the heart just tends, does tend to recover in the majority of patients. So that's another mechanism. 
The, another mechanism is plaque rupture. What that means is that many older people, particularly older people, people who have diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, who are overweight, they can develop plaque in their heart arteries. They get cholesterol rich plaque in their heart arteries. The plaque is not doing anything. It's not obstructing blood flow. So the patient doesn't know anything. He's just getting on with his normal life, but he's got this plaque in his heart arteries. At times of extreme stress and inflammation, what can happen is a bit of the plaque can rupture and break off. And at that point, the body thinks that where it's ruptured, there's a wound and tries to form a blood clot to seal off that wound. The problem is that this blood clot will inadvertently block off the whole vessel and result in a sudden heart attack and possibly even sudden death. And that is potentially another mechanism by which people sustain heart muscle damage as a result of the virus, but it's an indirect effect of the virus. Finally, there's this thing called cytokine storm. Um, cytokines are protective proteins which are produced by the infected body to boost immunity, but sometimes you can get such a surge of this, they can get out of control and can start spreading beyond the infected bits and start attack attacking, paradoxically attacking healthy tissue, and that could be another mechanism. So those are the possible mechanisms behind how you can get this injury to the heart as a result of the virus. At this point, it seems that it is more likely that people who have an underlying heart condition uh, that has been undetected are more likely to be the ones that sustain myocardial injury from the virus rather than being a direct effect of the virus attacking healthy heart. Okay, There's little evidence to say, definitive evidence at this point in time, to say that the virus actually just goes for the heart as well. Uh, the good news is, if there is any good news in all this, is that Firstly, if the damage is um, not enough to be seen on an echocardiogram, let's say you come in and your troponin is elevated. Yes, you've sustained a bit of heart damage, but if you do an echocardiogram and you don't see a large area of damage, then in general, the prognosis is good. Okay, provided you recover from your virus, the COVID virus, the, the heart, the damage to the heart if as long as it's not visible on an echo and the function overall function on echo is it satisfactory, then the general prognosis is good. Uh, the second thing to say is if the heart is indeed damaged on the echocardiogram, there is a good chance it may get better by itself once you recover from the illness. The third thing to say is that we have some really good medications available now. And if the heart is damaged, uh, administration of those medications in the long run has been shown to substantially improve the likelihood of um, improving prognosis and also improving heart function. So I hope you found this useful. I would love to hear from you. Um, and if you think this is useful, please consider sharing it with someone who may be in a dark place worried about their heart at this point in time. As I learn more, I would be delighted to share it with you. But once again, thank you so much for everything you do. This has been a hard time. I've not been able to put, put many videos out, uh, but I will do. And once again, I am so, so appreciative and um, I'm very grateful for everything. Um, this is a time for us all to be grateful for whatever we have, uh, given what is happening in the world. Thank you so much. All the best. Bye.